I think it's time for us to go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, let's all stand together and uh, uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, for those of you online, welcome back to First Baptist Church, Barberville. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to come back to your house tonight and worship you, Lord, and lift up your name in praise and uh, dig a little deeper into your word, Lord, and, uh, and see what you have to uh, teach us tonight, Lord, uh, as we... Uh, study uh, a little bit more about uh, baptism and Jesus' baptism and uh, the book of Mark, and we just pray, Lord, that, uh, that tonight that we would uh, hear the message that you have for each one of us. In your name we pray, amen. And as we start off this evening, we're going to start off with, we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And 
does remember us and he does love his people and he his grace is it is enough it's so much more than enough but it is enough when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless words No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus You can be seated.
day today. Good afternoon. Had a good time celebrating with uh, Ben and Miles after church today, celebrating their baptisms. And uh, I was telling somebody this week, it seems like if you just come around the church these days, even in the middle of the week, it seems like there's just there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of joy uh, here in First Baptist Barberville. God's doing a lot of really good things. So this morning, we looked at the story of Jesus' baptism. It's covered in a couple of different places, but we looked in Mark chapter 1 this morning, and it's a fairly concise uh, version of Jesus' baptism, but there's still a lot in this in Mark chapter 1, and there's, a, there's really there's so much going on in this one scene, it, it was way more than we could ever pull out on a Sunday morning, so we're going to have to talk about a few extra things tonight as we go back and, and kind of revisit this, but let's read it together. Because there's so much symbolism in Jesus' baptism, and it really has a lot of implications for us too. So in Mark chapter 1, Mark begins writing by saying, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. John wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, one who is more powerful than I am coming, than I am is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being Torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Here's what we talked about this morning. We said that Jesus' baptism, really, there were four things that we had time to look at. One, it associated Jesus with John's message, it identified Jesus with sinful men, anointed Jesus for God's mission, and demonstrated God's plan. For me, in a couple different ways. One was to be saved, because this whole thing is a picture of salvation. But also, we need to be baptized. Jesus gives us that example. What did you take away from this morning? That Jesus' baptism was a beautiful picture of the Trinity. Oh, yeah. That we're all there. Yeah, isn't that so cool? So I can reiterate, that was a quick one. She said, Jesus' baptism was such a, a picture of the Trinity, all there. Right in the same scene, and it, and we don't always get that. We don't always. I mean, they are always there, but they're not always listed like that, right? What's a, so that being said, what's another place in Scripture where we see all three working together so explicitly? Creation, right? The Father speaks. John tells us the Son was active and and present and working and the Spirit was there hovering. It's, again, a beautiful picture of the Trinity. Very good. Anything else from this morning? Behind you there, Slick. Something stood out to me that I want you to address a little bit better. Okay. Is the voice from heaven. God spoke from the voice from heaven saying, I'm proud. It's my son. Yeah. But here in the scripture it says that evidently there's a whole bunch of people there. Yep. And probably at that time some of the <clears throat> elite, you know, leaders at the time was there trying to, you know, find out what John was doing. Right. So when God spoke, was it to a few? Did the whole countryside hear it? And if the whole countryside hear it, was that not a testament through the rest of the time that yes this is the son of God we can't crucify this guy right right so in Mark it says 
if you look at the pronouns, that's a good question. And I, this one's come up before. Um, if you look, we'll flip back right quick. Mark kind of makes it sound like a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We'll go back one more. Came up out of the water and he saw the heavens being torn open. So who's the he that saw the heavens? Well, is it Jesus or John? I have to think it's probably Jesus, right? And who hears the voice? Let's talk about that. Who, who heard it? Who saw it? Any thoughts? Those who believed. Those who believed. That, okay. One hypothesis. And? Well, if there was a dove, looks to me like it could be seen. And if there was a voice then, logically speaking, if the dove could be seen, then the voice could be heard. Okay. And, of course, the sun was there to be seen. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Who heard? Who saw? Did everybody present hear it? Okay, yeah. So, in Mark, yeah. Look, look how it's, it's worded. You are my beloved son, not this is my beloved son, but you are my beloved son. Does it say anything different anywhere else? Hmm. Flip over in your Bibles and maybe Matthew chapter 3 or John chapter 1. Matthew chapter 3 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized of you, and yet you come to me. Jesus says a lot for now. Skipping on, uh, John allowed it. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him. Okay, And he saw the Spirit, again, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Man. So that makes it sound like it was just him that could see that. It sounds more like it was Jesus, but then it says, This is my Son, instead of you're my Son. It gets a little confusing, doesn't it? Got Tony up front. <laughs> you get a star. <laughs> uh, in in Second Peter, this is Peter talking. Uh, he said, uh, "If I can find it here," he said, "We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty." For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So it kind of seems like he's saying we heard it. If not there, we heard it while we were on the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay. So we know they heard the voice on the mountain, yeah? Richard? Yeah, and I was just going to say in, in, in John, uh, uh, I guess it's 120 or 32, mm -hmm. and John testified, I watched the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but uh, he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see with the Spirit descending uh, and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. All right. So John obviously also saw what was going on. So whether or not anybody, it may have just been just what he and John saw and the others around may not have really saw that or heard it or right. saw something but didn't understand what it was and didn't really hear the verse, voice. But it sounds as though John at least heard what was going on. Definitely. So, yeah. I was going to bring John 1 up because we, we, I think looking at that, we could say for certain John definitely saw and heard, right? I mean, that's how he identified Jesus. 
So it's a little confusing. It's not, honestly, it's not really clear who all heard and who didn't. Um, but I think you're right, Nathan. If everybody did see that, then they should think, my goodness, this is him, right? Tom? In John 10, 4, Jesus is speaking here to us to give a little clarity. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Okay. So maybe a few others were privy to this. Either way, here, here's my thought. Either way, even if those in the crowd saw this, heard this, and still refused to believe that this was him, what else did they see and hear and observe and still refuse? Miracles. Miracles. I mean, you name it. Death and resurrection. I mean, countless miracles. And they still, their hearts were hard. So um, I think that probably tells us a whole lot about just human nature, right? And, and really how hard some of those hearts were, still are. Great question. I, I like that. And I like how everybody dug into a different part of Scripture. Good job. Anybody else? Thoughts, reflections from this morning? Questions from this morning? In that case, it was definitely necessary, I think, for those two people, if nobody else did. Jesus needed to see that, experience that. And John needed to as well. Because John is, at this point, kind of passing the torch to Jesus for his ministry as the forerunner to him, right? Okay. So, uh, one thing we talked about this morning was how beautiful baptism, just the picture of it is of what takes place in us spiritually. When, when we're crucified with Christ and we die uh, with Him and we're, we're raised to walk in a new, so, a new way of life. And um, I love baptism stories because everybody's kind of got a different story. And, we, we, and like I said this morning, in my Sunday school, we went around and we kind of shared our baptism story. Because it's a big part of our, our Christian walk and, and this journey from where we once were to, to where we are now. So that being said, let's take a minute. What's your baptism story? Don't be bashful. I got saved in the wintertime. We didn't have a baptistry. All right. So we waited till spring. Wow. And I was baptized in the creek. Once it got warm, huh? And then I was baptized in the Jordan not too long ago. I remember that. And the same as you. I, <laughs> I was baptized by John T. Patterson the Baptist. <laughs> and that meant a lot, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Let me try to shore this up. <clears throat> she was saved in a landmark Baptist church house, but I had to convert her out of that into Southern Baptist way of thinking. Well, it took a long time. <laughs> I was baptized in the Cumberland River, and uh, Dr. Maynard Head uh, was the pastor. If I'm, if I'm thinking correctly, this was his first pastorate hmm. at Swamp Pond. And I could swim like a fish, and it was an undertow uh, in the river that day. And that undertow caught me and swept me out of his hands. And <laughs> I was going down the river, so I turned around, and I was watching him. And he was just standing there mortified. <laughs> and I swam back up to him in his hands, and you could just see the smile just break out. <laughs> so... He almost got, let one get away. Oh, man. <laughs> yes, 
guess a couple of you have mentioned the Jordan River, or three of you, but uh, uh, I was baptized at uh, First Baptist Church, Eubank, when I was eight years old, but then also had the opportunity to get baptized in the Jordan River. And uh, when I come up out of the water uh, and got back up on the bank, brother, my roommate, Brother Leonard Lester, said, uh, I didn't see a dove descending on you, but there was a really big duck closing in on you from behind. <laughs> and so I said, I'll take the duck. Take you know? the duck, <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. I was baptized the first time when I was seven by Denville Taylor at Swamp Pond Baptist Church, the old Swamp Pond Church that's uh, kind of up the hall. It used to be up the holler. It's not there anymore. And uh, I, it was one of those deals. They uh, coming out of revival, and uh, they had one baptism scheduled for that morning. I got saved that Sunday morning and came back, and they baptized me Sunday night. So that was kind of neat. And then got baptized again in the Jordan uh, a couple years ago. Anybody else? Well, I got baptized when I was... Um... Nine or ten, I think, I can't remember exactly, um, at Muncie Creek Baptist in Leslie County. Um, and I'm trying to think. It was it was in the church. It wasn't in the river or anything because we had a baptistry. And then I got baptized again um, a few years ago by you. Um, and is it the Middle Fork that runs through? Yeah, Middle Fork of the Kentucky River over in Leslie County. A lot of people got baptized there in the river. That was that was a big day. <laughs> it was. It was. Anybody else? I found out. Um, I knew she'd been baptized, but my great aunt, I didn't really know where. Um, come to find out, she got baptized, and she named the year and everything. It's like 1957 or something. I don't know. It was a long time ago. But she got baptized yeah, so long ago, right? Somebody, you're laughing about that. <laughs> um, perspective. Um, she got baptized, I guess, at Roadside. Uh, there used to be a big enough creek that went through right there that you could they actually had baptisms right there um, where Roadside is. So, didn't know that. Anybody else? We had not been immersed baptized, and so we were going to Bellevue Baptist, and uh, when we went to be baptized, the assistant pastor said, oh, no, we can't do it tonight. I said, why not? He said, uh, nobody turned on the heater in the baptistry. It's cold. I said, I'll go cold. He said, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So you got baptized at Bellevue? That's cool. Awesome. Oh, come on back, Slick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add to it. Um, my mother was Baptist and my dad was Methodist and they went to the Methodist church, but mom wouldn't have us baptized there. And we went sporadically because we moved every year and some places we'd go to church and sometimes we wouldn't. And when I was 16, we were going to Brentwood United Methodist Church and I joined the church and was sprinkled. But my sister told him she wanted to be baptized like Jesus, so she got baptized in a pool. <laughs> and then we had... Um, gone to a Presbyterian church when we started in school and then we moved next door to Bellevue Baptist and we thought we're probably going to live in a small town the rest of our life and the best place to know we're probably going to hear the gospel is a Baptist church hmm. yeah. and then we wanted to be immersed baptized too but that's how we ended up there. Cool. Very good. So Jesus' baptism story is special, right? Because he didn't need to be baptized for the repentance of his sins. He didn't need to go and confess to, to John or anybody all these sins that he committed and, and repent from them. And so it's very unique. And the first thing we talked about this morning was how Jesus' baptism, first of all, associated him with, with John's ministry and with John's message. Now why was it important for Jesus to identify with John and what John had to say. Why did this matter so much? John was sent out before Jesus to 
make the way for him and prepare the people for his arrival. Exactly. So, so John, I mean, the prophets literally foretold that, that this thing would happen, right? I mean, uh, that, that John would be the forerunner to Jesus to prepare the way for him, to make straight the way of the Lord. So, so the, they needed this connection. And Jesus needed to um, identify with what John had to say. He needed to identify himself as the one that John was preaching about and then carry on the same message that John was was preaching. And that's exactly what Jesus would do. You read about what John had to preach. He basically said, y'all need to repent and, and get right. And when Jesus started preaching, what did Jesus say? The exact same thing. Repent because the kingdom of God is near. This is a question. Why do you think with all that being fulfilled and John being right there, why do you think when he was in prison, he asked Jesus if he was the one? What had happened? Yeah. All right. Anybody want to take a stab at that? She's talking about when John goes to prison. Why would he ask this? Are you going to do your thing now or what? Tony? Yeah. He was in prison. You know, his circumstances were not, not very good. And sometimes we can look at our circumstances and, and begin to have doubts. So yeah. John had doubts. My yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Good, good, good point. You know, John, I think John probably really wanted to be out there doing what God had commissioned him to do right now. He's, he's kind of trapped. And his, I don't know if he realized it completely or not, but his life is, is coming to an end pretty quick. And I think there's probably um, probably some with John, but definitely in those around him, there was this desire that Jesus would do more than just save us from our sins, right? And so I think that kind of bled through Jewish society a lot, that the Messiah was going to, yeah, he's going to save us from our sins and we're going to repent, but he's also going to get me out of this prison and get rid of these Romans. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So they are cousins, right? And so John had a little bit of information about Jesus and kind of uh, his, even his childhood. So there could be some of that. Good, good question. So anyway, they end up, Jesus from this point takes the torch and, and preaches the same message, right? Repentance. Now, how did John's message differ? Think about this. From that of the other religious leaders. What was unique about what John had to say compared to the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes? It wasn't as much about following the laws as it was changing your heart. All right. Good. Well said, Bill. Well said. Anybody else? In one sense, it wasn't so legalistic, but it was a push for holiness, right? So, but it, it, it's not just doing all these laws and following all these rules that you need to repent. You need to have a, a heart change. So, it's a little little different than what the others were preaching and, and, and teaching. So, Jesus, of course, would do this time and, and time again, really just in the face of those Pharisees and other religious leaders. Um, the second thing about Jesus' baptism that, that we talked about was how it identified him with those sinful people. And you think about, we don't know exactly how many people John had baptized. Something too. <clears throat> Circumcision was the mark of the believer under the law. Yeah. Baptism is the mark of the believer under the new covenant. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, John's kind of, and there was baptism leading up to that, except it was not a once and done type thing. They would, uh, certain parts, uh, sects of Judaism would practice ritual baptism, almost like a bath. And they'd dump themselves to kind of somewhat purify themselves. This was practiced a lot uh, in the Qumran community where they would, Translate, well not translate, but copy all of the different 
manuscripts, they, they find that they were maybe getting to the name of God and they, they weren't holy enough to write God's name, so they go baptize themselves. They come back and they'd write a letter. Oh, man, I'm, I'm unholy again. They'd go take another bath and they'd write another letter. And so it's over and over. Now, this is different, right? Because it goes back to that heart change, that circumcision of the heart. You're, going to be, you're repenting, you're going to be baptized, and you're different now. So, yeah, good point. So identifying with sinful humanity. John, John picks up on this, right? Jesus comes to John, and John's like, I, I don't need to baptize you. You need to be baptizing me. I am not worthy. And what does he say? I'm not, not only am I unworthy to baptize you, but I'm not even worthy to do what? Stoop down and untie the strap of your sandals. Now, now what's significant about that? That, that would be kind of like a hillbilly phrase in first century Palestine. Like something like we might we have these little sayings. That would be kind of like one of those things. That they understood what this meant. What does it mean? What's it say about John? So to do this, to get down on your hands and knees and undo somebody's sandal strap was a very demeaning thing to do in this culture. To the point that they normally wouldn't even allow a slave to do this for somebody else. It's just humiliating. It's demeaning. And so what's John's actually saying? He says, he's, he's looking at Jesus. He says, Jesus, I, I'm not even worthy to do what a slave is not allowed to do for you. I'm beneath that when it comes to you. You need to be baptizing me. I don't need to be baptizing you. But he convinces John, right? And so he says, John, we need to do this. Uh, we need to fulfill all righteousness. And in doing this, Jesus, again, identifies with those people that John's already baptized, those repentant sinners and those standing around. And he identifies with us. There's another picture here we didn't get into this morning. Um, but Jesus is baptized. Again, John realizes he's a sinful man who's been baptizing sinful men. And now he's baptizing a man who's never committed any sin, not just an, another man. Uh, but even John, though, is not an ordinary sinful man. What's, what's special about John's lineage? And what's special about him baptizing, or as we said this morning, anointing Jesus? What do we know about John and his parents? He's of a priestly line. John is of the tribe of Levi, a direct descendant of Aaron. Both his parents, mother and father, are of Aaron, Arianic descent. So he's double steeped in this priestly line. And what did priests do in the Old Testament? They took these sacrifices and they presented them to the Lord, didn't they? And so now you have a picture of a, not just a Baptist, John the Baptist, but a Levitical priest taking, as he would call him, the Lamb of God and baptizing him. Anointing him for this mission that we, like we talked about this morning. And when he does that, the heavens literally tear open and God says, You are my son and I'm well pleased. This is a sacrifice that pleases me. It's pretty big stuff. So the last thing we talked about Jesus' baptism was what it really means for us, what it demonstrates for us. Yes, God wants us to be saved. He wants us to go from death to life like we talked about this morning. And he does want us to be baptized. So let's talk about that as we kind of wrap this up. What, what does baptism really mean for us? You know, when we go up into the baptistry or we go down to the river, what's it really mean? What, what's happening? Is there anything that's you know, taking place in us? Uh, and the big one is, is it really necessary? What are your thoughts? I'm 
Not everybody at once. Baptism is a portrait. Yeah. And within that portrait, <clears throat> we're following Jesus. Death, burial, and resurrection. Mm. And what happens is that we're saying from the personal, the private, <clears throat> and we're going public. Yeah, good. We're not ashamed of it. Yeah. And it is necessary to take that first step of obedience. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? So this has been a big topic lately. Um, at my house with two little girls. Um, so uh, Kira was baptized two weeks ago, so she has been hounding uh, the little one, Kendra. About, Easton does that to Audrey too a lot. Yeah, she, she tried to evangelize her. Audrey about last year, and he's like, he was appalled that she wouldn't get saved. I'm like, buddy, she's she's three, man. Give her give her a couple of years. <laughs> she wanted to drag her to you this morning, um, but. She was trying to explain it to her. She's like, I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know what all this means. And um, Kira said, um, when you are baptized, it's you standing up and telling everybody that you adore Jesus um, publicly. And I thought that was such a good little phrase is that you adore him. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You're, you're going. I, I like that. You're going public. Mm -hmm. It's a public statement, expression. Um, some have called it an, an outward expression of an inward change that's taking place, right? And um, it's not magical. I mean, it's not like you're suddenly um, all the bad stuff gets washed down the drain or down the river, right? It's it's symbolic. It's a portrait, like Tom said, a picture. But it's it, it's a beautiful picture. And it's one that the Lord himself modeled and, and ordained for us. Richard. And uh, again, with baptism, it doesn't, it doesn't save us. But the necessary part, I think, is that, I like when we use the phrase, we submit to baptism. Yeah. Because it's necessary that we must submit. In order to be saved, you have to submit. You have to submit yourself to the Lord. Yeah. Um, you can't just... You really just can't declare that he's the Lord. I mean, you need to submit yourself and surrender yourself that you can't do it. So it's an act of submission. And if you can't go through that act of submission, number one, you're not being obedient to what he's told you to do. But right. one has to question oneself, why can't I submit uh, to the baptism? Yeah. So is it necessary for salvation? No. I mean, obviously, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized and he was saved. But uh, And if, you, if it can't be done, it can't be done. But But... It is the first act, and so it's necessary because we need to submit. Yeah, very good, very good. So that brings us to this next question. What keeps people from being baptized? Pride. Pride. Afraid to walk. You, you, you would be surprised how, how often that, that is. She said they're afraid of water. And some people really don't want you grabbing their head and holding them underwater. <laughs> Especially when you don't hold their nose. <laughs> what else keeps people from being baptized? Not understanding it. Not understanding it, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Because I think a lot of folks feel like they, it, again, it, it kind of goes to that back to that thing. Some people think before they get saved, they need to get all this stuff right. And then they get saved, and they're like, well... Before I get baptized, I need to get all this stuff right. And so it's, it's not understanding exactly what baptism is and what it means. What else? Going back to what Richard said, that submission. Yeah. Submission. We, we, we were unwilling or, or whatever the case may be to submit in that act of obedience. Right? Okay. Did anybody have trouble? Did you, ever, did you struggle with baptism at all? 
I was, I was, I know as a kid, I was eager to. I was, I wanted to get baptized as soon as I could, right? After I got saved. But, you know, some people deal with this. Some people go a long time. Well, prime example this morning, right? Ben had been saved a long time ago, but he was never, never baptized. And so, thankfully, he took that step of obedience with his son. I thought that was pretty awesome. But some people just, just don't. Any other thoughts? Fear is a great motivator, and when you when all that worry and fear descended on me, I had to do something to get out. It was like being a worm in the fire. I had to do something to get it, to get it taken care of. Yeah. yeah, fear can be a big one. Okay, well let's let's end on this next question. I, I want to kind of talk through this because I think it's a good one to understand too. At what point should somebody be baptized? We don't baptize babies in this church. But at what point does it make sense to baptize someone? When does it not make sense to baptize someone? What's the Bible say? Okay. I'm coming back. <laughs> he beat you to the punch, Tom. <laughs> Jane was supposed to not let me say anything else. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've always heard the phrase, upon a believable profession of faith. Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, that's why I, I like the term believer's baptism. Um, because you're baptizing a believer. And upon that, be good, good phrase, believable profession of faith, it's time to get baptized. Tom? Let's go to the Great Commission. All right. Actually, it starts with the 16th verse of the 28th chapter of Matthew. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Mm. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I think that that is consecutively put. When someone's saved, there's that submission. You're wanting to take the first step of obedience. Yeah. That you want to do that. Yeah, and that's when, when somebody gets saved, that, that's what I encourage. I say, hey, look, one, you need to tell somebody you got saved. You need to let them know, and, and that's good for you, too. Two, it's, let's figure out when you're going to get baptized, right? Because, I mean, if you're, if you're really saved, you're going to follow Jesus, this is your next step. Next step ain't necessarily getting plugged into Sunday school and all this stuff, although that's good. Your next, the next thing in your mind it should be baptism if you're a believer. I think it's, it's neat, <laughs> you read through the New Testament, especially when the church is just growing so quickly and, and you've got you know, those thousands saved at Pentecost and then they turn around and they're like, man, let's, let's get to baptizing. Of course, that's, that was a unique experience, but can you imagine the, the, just the logistics of trying to baptize that many people? We baptized like 20 people one morning at, at church and we had the, the pool was kind of... The, Baptistry was just a little bit warm, I'll be honest. And after about 15, I thought I was going to have a heat stroke, man. Uh, I can't imagine baptizing 3,000. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts? I like your, I like your all's answers. Upon a believable profession of faith, right, you know, the next step in your, your faith walk. Well, any other questions about baptism, about anything we talked about, or uh, anything to add? I guess that's why the Catholics started sprinkling 
Yeah, it's a lot faster, I guess. But. <laughs> it's a lot easier. <laughs> Come on through. We, we'll set up a line here just sprinkle you, sprinkle you through. <laughs> yeah. But when it comes to stuff like this, and this is what I like uh, about, I'll just be honest, about Baptists. We try to do these kind of things as close to scriptures as we know how, right? We try to do it the right way, the right timing after that decision to, to follow Jesus, after you're saved. We're not going to baptize you beforehand. It don't really make, it's not believer's baptism if, if we do it that way. So you get the order right. We do it uh, according to the, the language that's used, like we talked about this morning. The, the Greek word, baptizo, we're going to is, you know, completely immerse you and bring you up. And you should be different when you come out. Because of what Jesus has done. Okay, anybody else? Well, we got just a few minutes. Uh, what kind of...